in our earlier program, Dr. Pratap just got us started, which is great, and I'm going to formally welcome everybody to day two of the 39th Annual Yoga Research Society Conference, Yoga in the Matrix of Life, and remind us that yesterday was a marvelous day, and today will be no different. Um, we'll continue to explore and discover, reveal, and uncover secrets about the matrix of life. And with Dr. Pratap um, sharing secrets of, practice, of yoga practices and meditation and relaxation uh, to calm our savage beasts, with uh, Dr. Uh, Tucker's provocative secrets of reincarnation and his groundbreaking research of life before life, with Jocelyn Kessler's secrets about connections and communications with our beloved companions, our dogs, and unveiling secrets of mapping the human body field and how information and energy can significantly treat disease with Sarah Turner from Harry Massey's organization, Ness Health. Um, as far as setting the tone for the rest of the day, we wanted to share the words of a City of Philadelphia tribute that the Yoga Research Society received, which was signed by then Mayor Ed Rendell, which reads in part, since 1975, the Yoga Research Society has brought to Philadelphia distinguished teachers, scientists, researchers, physicians, artists, and musicians to participate in its annual international conference. Guest speakers and performers from India, China, Tibet, Japan, Israel, Switzerland, England, Canada, Brazil, and elsewhere, and from throughout the United States, have come here to join with their counterparts from the greater Philadelphia region to exchange ideas and to share experiences. The Yoga Research Society's mission has been to carry on the work begun in 1924 by Swami Kuvalayanandaji, India's pioneering exponent of a modern scientific approach to yoga. Under the direction of Dr. Vijayendra Pratap, the society has helped to integrate yoga techniques and principles into Western medical theory and practice. As a result, Philadelphia has become known as a center for integrative health care throughout the world and a leader in the effort to have Eastern and Western science work together for a healthier, healthier 21st century. I now have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Jim Tucker, who is a Bonner Lowry Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia. A board certified child psychiatrist, Dr. Tucker served as the medical director of the UVA Child and Family Psychiatry Clinic for nine years. He is also continuing the work of Ian Stevenson at the UVA Division of Perceptual Studies with children who report memories of previous lives. His book, Life Before Life, Children's Memories of Previous Lives, describes a collection of 2,500 cases that investigators have carefully studied since Dr. Ian Stevenson began this work more than 40 years ago. His second book, a collection of American cases called Return to Life, Extraordinary Cases of Children Who Remember Past Lives, will be published this December. Dr. Tucker attended the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill where he graduated Phi Beta Kappa with a BA degree in psychology in 1982, followed by a medical degree four years later. He then completed a residency in general psychiatry and a fellowship in child psychiatry, also at the University of Virginia. After nine years in his private practice, he returned to the university and since then has published numerous uh, articles in scientific journals. He's given talks to both scientific and general audiences and has discussed his work um, on such programs as Good Morning America, Larry King Live and CBS Sunday Morning. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Tucker. All right. Good morning. Um, hope everyone can hear me all right. My voice may not carry quite as well as Mark's does, but. Uh, I want to thank the Society and, and Dr. Pratap for the invitation, and um, I want to especially thank Mark for his uh, audiovisual help. The uh, third computer proved to be the charm, so it's uh, thanks to him that we can even have this talk. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is this phenomenon of young children who report memories of, of past lives, and I'm going to start by reviewing the history of the work a little bit. Uh, then I'll go over the, the features of the cases, uh, then tell you about some recent American cases that I've studied 
Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, patterns about how these things might work. Um, so as far as the history of the work goes, the um, University of Virginia is a pretty traditional place, and, and one of the most extraordinary parts about the work is that it's taken place at all. And <clears throat> it began uh, with Ian Stevenson. He was um, a quite successful mainstream psychiatrist who came to the University of Virginia uh, back in 1957 to be the chairman of, of the Department of Psychiatry. At that point, he was still in his late 30s and was um, doing very well for himself. Uh, <clears throat> when he interviewed for the job, he told people that he had an interest in parapsychology, but he had a lot of other interests as well, and, and no one particularly seemed to mind. And then the following year, um, a journal had a contest for the best essay uh, related to the question of life after death. And Ian submitted what turned out to be the winning essay. And uh, it was called The Evidence for Survival from Claimed Memories of Former Incarnations. And what he did was uh, he took, he had collected over the years um, cases, uh, write-ups of cases of children talking about past lives from various places, books, magazines, newspapers, wherever he had seen them. And then he collected 44 of them and, and analyzed them in this paper. And what he noticed was that almost all of the most impressive cases involved kids under the age of 10, and many of them even under the age of 3. And as he said years later, when you put them together, it seemed to me that there must be something there. Uh, so he was intrigued by this phenomenon. And in fact, in the paper, he suggested it might be good for somebody to go out and look to see if, if current cases could be found like the ones that he had collected over the years. Uh, having no idea that he would be the one to do it. Um, but after the paper was published, he got uh, a letter from a woman, Eileen Garrett, who was head of the Parapsychology Foundation. She had heard about a case in India that was similar to the ones he had written about. So she asked him if, if she paid his way, would he go to India and investigate? So he decided to do that. And by the time of the trip to India, he had heard about um, five cases, and he went there for a month and found 25 cases. And he got same results in Sri Lanka, and he realized this thing was much more common than anyone in the West had any idea about. Uh, so he became intrigued and began taking more trips. Um, this is uh, him in Burma, and um, as you can imagine, an American professor shows up in an Asian village and starts asking about past life memories. It tends to draw quite a crowd. Um, so with this, he would sometimes designate one chair to be sort of the witness chair and find out from that person um, what they had to say about the case while everyone else looked on. And um, most of his trips were to Asia. There are places where uh, people would talk about these cases when they happened, so they were easiest to find. And he always um, used a very careful, methodical approach when he studied these. Uh, he never assumed that they represented reincarnation, and he didn't approach it with, with uh, from the standpoint of, of a religious or, or wisdom tradition or anything like that. Um, but just from a scientific point of view of trying to determine exactly what had happened in these cases. And, and that's the same approach that we still use 50 years later. And um, I won't necessarily say alleged memories as I talk about these cases, but we consider it an open question with, with each case we study. Um, so Ian, over the years, published numerous books and, and scientific articles about these cases. Uh, the first one he published was one called 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation. And that title is sort of typical of, of his approach where he was never making any grand claims. What he was trying to do is get this data on the record, put it out there, and then people could make of it uh, what they would. Um, and in this book and in all his publications, he, he reviewed the cases in, at times, excruciating detail. But he, he wanted everyone to know all the details as, as 
much as possible. And he would review the strengths and weaknesses for each case. So again, he, he wasn't trying to promote any particular view, but just trying to uh, let people know what was happening. Um, his first book was reviewed by the American Journal of Psychiatry. And they said, in this series, there are cases recorded in such full detail as to persuade the open mind that reincarnation is a tenable hypothesis to explain them. Dr. Stevenson provides us much to ponder on. He kept studying the cases and um, over the years uh, published a, a series of, of books. The first one, Cases from India, then Sri Lanka, Lebanon and Turkey, Thailand and Burma. Uh, the first one, the one from India, was reviewed in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, and <clears throat> JAMA, as actually the book review editor who wrote the review, wrote, in regard to reincarnation, he has painstakingly and unemotionally collected a detailed series of cases from India, cases in which the evidence is difficult to explain on any other grounds. Um, Ian kept working. He worked for years on another book that I'm going to talk about in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, and he also worked to try to get other researchers interested in this work, because one of the criticisms uh, of his research was that he was the only one publishing these cases. And um, not that it was his fault other people weren't doing it, but that was, was sort of a weakness with it. But he did get other people, a small number of other people, uh, involved in studying the cases as well. Um, this is not easy work to do, uh, which may be why more people didn't get involved with it, but it it's, was traveling th through um, uh, various villages in, in various parts of Asia, which not always places that were easy to get to. Uh, but some people did get involved, and uh, this was a replication paper by three of them. Um, and in it, they wrote, the investigations of three independent researchers into reported cases of reincarnation in five cultures suggest that some children identify themselves with a person about whom they have no normal way of knowing. In these cases, the children apparently exhibit knowledge and behavior appropriate to that person. Uh, and each of them has then published a number of, of articles themselves. Um, so now, 50 years later, there's quite a, a body of, of literature on this from, from a variety of people. Um, Ian himself kept publishing and kept working. He um, uh, retired in 2002 and in his 80s at that point. And, and even after he retired, he made one more trip to India. Um, he, he was a very hardworking researcher. And his wife at one point said she didn't mind him continuing to make the trips. She just wished that he wouldn't say each one was the final trip. Um, <laughs> Now, as I say, he made one even after he had retired. Then he passed away in, in 2007. Uh, he had been uh, active and productive almost until the very end. Uh, his last paper was published a, a year before he died. And the, the final words in the paper were, let no one think that I know the answer. I am still seeking, which I thought was a wonderful way to, uh, to go out. Um, so now to talk with you about the, the features of these cases. Um, these are very young children who spontaneously start talking about a past life. This does not involve hypnosis, hypnotic regression, or anything like that. They are just kids who uh, describe very recent, ordinary lives. They're not talking about being kings or queens or famous people or being Cleopatra or Pocahontas or whatever. Um, but just ordinary people who generally lived close by and um, lived quite recently. The, the median interval between the death of the previous person and the birth of the child is only 16 months. Now, there are some exceptions, and I'm going to review one of them in a little bit. But uh, for the most part, these are very recent lives, usually in the same country that the, uh, the child was in. Some of them would describe being a deceased family member. Uh, but others will say that they were a stranger in another location. And if they give enough details like the name of that location, then people have often gone there and found that, in fact, somebody did live and die whose life matches the details that the child gave. In that case, we would say it is a solved case. Uh, sometimes the kids may talk quite a bit about 
um, another life, but if they don't give details like the names or the places, then no one can verify whether it was an actual life or not. So in that case, we would say it was unsolved. Uh, we've got plenty of, of both types in our collection. Of course, the solved ones tend to be the, the more interesting ones. And then uh, the, the one part about the past life that is often out of the ordinary is how the previous person died. Uh, in 70% of the cases, the person died a, a violent or unnatural death. So that certainly seems to be an important factor here, and, and uh, I'll talk more about it um, in a little bit. Um, I want to tell you about one of Ian's cases. Um, <clears throat> this is him with uh, the girl, Kum Kum Verma, and then a couple of associates. This is during one of his follow-up trips. She was actually a little girl when, when he first met her. And Kum Kum was a uh, girl who was grown up in an Indian village, but she uh, began to say that she had lived in the city of Darbanga, which was a city of a couple hundred thousand people uh, that was 25 miles away. And not only that she lived in Darbanga, but she named the district of the city where she said she had lived. And, and this was a district of, of artisans and craftsmen. Um, she made a lot of statements, and her aunt wrote down some of them. Uh, Ian was able to get a copy of the aunt's uh, notes and have them translated into English. And, and she had documented 18 statements that the little girl had, had made about the past life. And they included details like the name of her son from that life, uh, the name of um, her grandson, the fact that her son worked with a hammer, the town where her father had lived, and some uh, specific personal details like the fact that she had an iron safe at home, uh, that there was a sword hanging near the cot where she slept, and even that there was a pet snake that she fed milk to. Uh, so very specific statements that are all documented. Um, Kum Kum's family didn't know anyone from Darbanga, uh, but her father told a friend of his about this, and the friend had someone who worked for him who, in fact, was from Darbanga. He went there and found that, in fact, there was a woman who had lived and died in the district of the city that um, Kum Kum had mentioned, whose life matched all the details that, that I've just given you. Uh, this. Uh, woman and her family, they were complete strangers to Kum Kum's family, and they even remained strangers after the case was solved. Um, Kum Kum's father uh, visited the, the previous family once, but he never allowed Kum Kum to go. And he, uh, was a, he was a well-to-do landowner, and he was apparently embarrassed that uh, his daughter seemed to be remembering the life of a blacksmith's wife. And there is certainly no reason to think that the family could have perpetuated this as a fraud for some reason. Um, all right, now with, with uh, some more features. Uh, first, the location. We've now found over 2,500 cases around the world. And they are easiest to find in, a cult in cultures with a belief in reincarnation. So uh, I've listed the countries where we have found the most of them. Um, but these are the places where we've had people looking for them. And in fact, they've been found wherever anyone has looked for them. Um, so like we have a lot of cases from Thailand and Myanmar or Burma. Uh, we have virtually none from Vietnam um, because we haven't had any associates looking for them there. Now, I did recently get a, an email from someone in Vietnam, and, and he had found a case there, and, and actually one from Laos, too. So uh, they are all over, but we can't go all over to, to look for them. Um, but they have been found wherever anyone has looked for them. They've been found on uh, all the continents except Antarctica, where we have not looked yet. Um, and they've been found in the West as well. Um, they seem to be more common in cultures with the belief in reincarnation, but it's very hard to tell because they're certainly easier to find there. Um, but the thing is here, people don't tend to talk about them as much. Um, we have, have um, heard from cases where the parents haven't even told the grandparents what the children are saying because uh, people here tend to be a little embarrassed because it seems weird. Whereas in Asia, uh, many places in Asia, not all to be sure, um, people don't mind talking about them and so the word spreads 
sometimes even in the newspaper, and then our associates hear about them, and, and so we study them. Um, so not sure exactly if they're less common here, but they certainly are here, and, and I will talk about them uh, in a few minutes. Uh, another one of the features of these cases that Ian was quite interested in was birthmarks. And he wrote a book that I mentioned earlier. This is Reincarnation in Biology, which uh, involves cases of where children are born with birthmarks or birth defects that match wounds on the body of the previous person, usually the fatal wounds. And um, so along with the statements were these objective evidence with these uh, birthmarks and birth defects and, and reincarnation in biology, uh, Ian wrote about 200 such cases and done with his usual um, compulsiveness, the, the book is over 2,000 pages long, um, so you may not have seen it on the bestseller list, um, but there are quite some interesting cases in it and <clears throat> while I won't review all 200 of them, uh, I will tell you about a couple. There was one where um, a little girl talked about a man who was murdered and his fingers were chopped off uh, as he was being killed and she was born with uh, her fingers looking like that. Um, there was a little boy who remembered a boy in, in uh, another village who had lost his fingers in, uh, of the right hand in a fodder chopping machine and then this little boy was born with his hands looking like that. And for a birthmark like this, a birth defect where one side is, um, has no fingers and, and the other hand is perfectly fine, it's a very unusual birth defect. Um, and then to tell you a little more detail about another one of the cases, <clears throat> there's a little boy in Thailand named Chennai. And this is a boy who had two birthmarks that matched the previous person. Uh, when he was three years old, he began to say that he had been a school teacher named uh, Bua Kai and that he had been shot on the way to school one day. Um, he talked a lot about his previous family, begged to be taken to his previous parents, and he named the place where he said he had lived. So eventually, when he was three years old, his um, grandmother, who was raising him, uh, the two of them went on a bus to this place where he had named. They got off the bus. Uh, Chennai then led the way to a home where there was an uh, older couple living in this house that he seemed to recognize. And they had had a son named Buakai Lonak. And um, in fact, he had been a teacher. Uh, he apparently was also a gangster on the side and had had numerous uh, affairs and made lots of enemies. And one day, five years before Chennai was born, uh, as he was riding his bike to school, somebody shot and killed him. And uh, Ian was not able to get an autopsy report, which he always tries to do, but he did talk with, with Buakai's widow, who said she was told that he had um, been shot from behind because he had a uh, small round entrance wound on the back of his head and a larger, more regularly shaped wound uh, on the front. And Chennai had been born, uh, hopefully these pictures show up, but with a small round, uh, birthmark on the back of his head and then a more regularly shaped birthmark. Uh, his parents said it was on his forehead when he was born and then it had migrated back as, as he had grown. Uh, and in fact, in, in reincarnation biology, Ian talks about the fact that he had 18 cases of double birthmarks where a uh, child was born with birthmarks that matched both the entrance and the exit wound of, of somebody who had been shot. Now, as if these cases weren't strange enough, uh, there's also a phenomenon that Ian called experimental birthmarks. And this is a practice in, in several areas in Asia where uh, after somebody dies, somebody will um, say a prayer or make a wish and then mark the body, usually with soot or paste, and make this wish that they carry the mark with them to their next life so that they can be identified. And this is usually done with the expectation that the child will be born in the same family. Um, so Ian had studied 20 of these cases, then a colleague and I found 18 more. And um, one of the ones that we found is, is a little boy in Thailand whose grandmother died. And 
Before she died, uh, she had told a family member that she hoped to come back as a male so that one day she could have a mistress the way that her husband did. <laughs> and after she died, um, her daughter-in-law took some white paste and just made a mark down the back of her neck. And then uh, five years later, this little boy was born and he had this mark on the back of his neck. Uh, and he also made some, some statements of, about uh, his grandmother's life. And he's what we call a sex change case. Uh, most of the kids, 90% of the kids, will talk about a past life as the same sex, but, but the others will, will do the opposite sex. And, and he's an example of, of the sex change case. Um, another one that's also a sex change case is this little girl in, in Thailand who uh, her grandfather died five years before she was born. And after he died, uh, her aunt made a mental wish and then took some soot from the bottom of the rice pot. I had one of the villagers to show what that looks like. And um, she marked his uh, right leg um, just above his ankle. And then the little girl was born five years later and she was born with that birthmark right above her ankle. Um, when we met her, she was only two and a half, and she hadn't made any clear statements related to the past life at this point. Uh, she had uh, complained about her mother's gambling, apparently, which was something that, that the grandfather complained about all the time, too. Uh, but there were no definite um, comments about the, uh, the past life. Uh, and then the last experimental birthmark case I want to tell you about is one of Ian's. Um, this, unfortunately, is a previous person. Um, this was a young woman in Burma who was born with a congenital heart defect. And then when she was 20 years old, uh, she died during open heart surgery. After she died, three of her classmates prepared her body for cremation. And they'd heard about bodies being marked, so they took some red lipstick and marked the back of her neck with it. Uh, then a year later, her older sister gave birth to a girl that had a birthmark. And it's this one here. Hopefully that shows up as, as a red area there. Now, as Ian pointed out, they picked the worst possible place to mark a body because stork bite birthmarks are fairly common and will occasionally persist into childhood. Uh, but in any case, it was, it was present there. And when Ian studied this case, the other thing he noticed was this little girl uh, had a white line, uh, which I hope you can see without too much imagination, uh, but a white line running uh, down her front from sort of mid-sternum to mid-abdomen. So it looked very similar to a uh, cardiac surgery scar, except it was lower, at least by the time he saw her when she was four years old. Um, and she had made a number of statements about the past life. She, she had uh, asked to be called by the previous person's name. Uh, she called her mom the term for older sister and uh, called her uncle brother, her, her grandfather papa. And uh, when Ian studied the case, he interviewed the young women who had marked the body separate from the family, and he discovered that one of them had never met the little girl. So unannounced, he takes the marker uh, to the little girl's home. They walk in, he says, who is this? And the little girl immediately says, Min Min Oo, which in fact was the name of the young woman uh, who had marked the body. All right. So now, uh, moving on from the birthmarks, I want to talk a little bit about the statements that these kids make. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned that they're young. Uh, the average age when the kids start talking about a past life is 38 months. So they're usually two or three years old uh, when they start coming out with these things. And some of them will do so in sort of a detached manner, but others will show strong involvement with the memories. They may beg to be taken to the previous family. Uh, they may cry every day. Some of them will express a lot of anger, especially if the previous person was murdered. Uh, there's a little boy in Thailand um, who I studied, and um, this was a case where a young man had gone hunting with friends of his, and, and one of the friends had accidentally, his gun had gone off, and he'd accidentally killed this man. Um, and then a few years later, this boy was born in the same village, 
and talked about this past life and when he was two years old tried to choke the man that had accidentally killed the, the fellow in, in, uh, in the past life. Um, and it seems that in the stronger cases the kids show more emotion than in the weaker cases. So it seems that there's more sort of past life uh, material that, that has come through. But even so, the kids may show great intensity talking about these things one minute and then just run off and play the next. And some of the kids have to be in the right frame of mind to, uh, to even access these memories. There are others who can talk about it at any time. But there's some where they just seem to kind of have to be in the right zone for, for this material to be available to them. Um, and then by the time they get to be six or seven, most of the kids stop talking about this stuff and then just go on with their lives. And we have thought that they forget about the past life. Um, they certainly stopped talking about it. A colleague of ours recently uh, did a study where he went to Asia and he interviewed adults who had been studied when they were children, either studied by him or studied by Ian. And he found a surprising number said that they still had memories of a past life, even though they had stopped talking about them years ago. However, it gets a little complicated. When he asked them about the memories, a lot of the ones that they said were not ones that anyone had mentioned when they were kids. So it's not clear what to make of that. It may be that they remember that they re remembered a past life, but then they sort of embellished it over the years and as they lost the actual memories. Uh, but in any case, the kids do stop talking about these things almost always and then go on to, to live sort of ordinary lives. Um, as far as what they talk about, they don't tend to come out, unfortunately, with enlightened words of wisdom. I mean, occasionally they may say philosophical things, but they mostly focus on the end of the previous life. Um, 75% of them will talk about how the previous person died. And um, they'll also talk about people or events from near the end of the life. So if, if a child is describing having been an adult, they'll be much more likely to talk about parents than talk, I mean, to talk about a spouse or, or kids than to talk about his parents. Uh, so it's as if the memories have just sort of picked up where they left off at, at the end of the last life. And um, also, about 20% of the children will talk about events between lives. Now, most of the kids don't. Uh, but some of these kids will talk about uh, either staying nearby where the previous person lived or going to other realms like heaven. And, and the American kids sometimes will use the word heaven. Um, when they stay nearby, they will occasionally come up with facts that are verifiable. So, for instance, there was a, a little girl in Thailand that Ian studied who uh, made a lot of statements. And one of the things she said was she was upset that after she had died that her ashes had been scattered rather than buried the way that she wanted them. And after the previous person was identified, it, it turned out that there is a woman who had asked that her ashes be buried under the bow tree of the temple complex where she studied. Um, but when her daughter went to bury them. The root system of the tree was so extensive that she couldn't, so she had to scatter them instead. Uh, so that was an example of, of uh, verified statements, uh, verified memories from between lives. Um, and as far as the mode of death goes, uh, I want to talk about that a couple of minutes because it, it does seem to be an important factor in these cases. Um, with each case, we code them on, on 200 variables. And it's taken us years and years to get all of the old cases coded, but we're, we've got over 2,000 of them in the database now. So one of the things we code for are features related to death. So this is a fairly complicated graph um, where the going up and down is just a number of cases. And then going across is the age when the previous person died. Uh, and then these green bars on top are all the natural deaths. And all the other colors are all the various kinds of unnatural deaths. Uh, so the, the main point of this slide is that we have a lot of unnatural deaths. And, and like I said, it, it's 70% um, of them. Uh, but it also looks like the people are dying young. Uh, the complicating fact is that people who die unnatural deaths do tend to die young. Um, but what we can do with our database is just pull out the unnatural death ones and look at the natural death to see if, if, if 
dying young is, is also a, a factor. Uh, and when we do this, um, this is a, a graph that I just pulled off the internet, but this is just a typical graph of the number of deaths by age, and, and you get this gradually upsloping curve as, as you get to the older and older age groups until eventually there's so few people left that it stops drop, uh, starts dropping off. But most of the lifespan is just gradually, whoa. All right. How bizarre. Okay, we're back on. Um, so, this is a typical graph, and then this is the graph of our natural death cases, and the curve goes the other way. And in fact, a quarter of the natural death cases are under the age of 15. Uh, so it appears that there's something about people dying violently or dying young that then leads children to later talk about their lives. Um, also, looking at the mode of death, we have known for a long time that we have more boys talking about past lives than girls. It's about 60% boys. And we have speculated why that might be, and, and I think we now have the answer. Um, I mentioned uh, that 90% of the kids recall a life as a member of the same sex. And what we see here is that, I know you can't read this at the bottom, but the, the one on the left are males and the one on the right is females. If you look at the natural death cases, it's 50-50 with the same number of, of men and women that have died, or boys and girls that have died naturally. But in the unnatural death cases, it's a lot more uh, males that have died unnaturally. In, in our database is 73 percent of the unnatural deaths uh, were males. When you look in the general population of what percentage of people die unnatural deaths, uh, the best that I found was 72 percent, so it's exactly the same. Um, so the fact that these male-female ratios match perfectly with natural and unnatural death uh, to me is, is further evidence that, that these are memories of genuine, a genuine sample of past lives. Um, and along with the statements are also behaviors. I mentioned that uh, these kids tend to be emotional and they will show emotions toward the individual members of the previous family that are appropriate for the relationship that the previous person had with them. So for instance, a little girl may be very deferential toward the um, husband from the previous life or toward the parents, but very bossy toward the younger siblings, even though those younger siblings are much older than, than the child is. And um, these emotions will usually dissipate as, as the statements do, uh, but not always. And there's at least one case where the uh, little boy eventually grew up to marry the widow of the previous person. Uh, she's a little bit older than he was. Um, and then phobias. In the unnatural death cases, uh, over 35% of the kids will show a phobia toward the mode of death. So, uh, for instance, um, in a drowning case, uh, there was a little girl who, from the time she was born, hated to be in water. And even as an infant, it would take three adults to hold her down to give her a bath. And then when she got old enough to talk, uh, she described the life of a girl in another village who had drowned in an accident. Uh, likes and dislikes. Uh, this picture, if you can see, is a child smoking a cigarette. Um, this is not one of our cases, but, but it could be, because unfortunately it seems that the appeal that addictive substances can have can, either, can even go across lifetimes. Uh, so these little children will sometimes try to, to sneak cigarettes or even sneak shots of liquor. Uh, there's one case in Sri Lanka where a neighbor is letting a little boy actually have liquor and, until his family found out about it and put a stop to it. Um, and then foods also, the, the most um, clearest examples, uh, in Burma, Ian found a couple of dozen cases of um, kids who said they had been Japanese soldiers who had been killed in Burma during World War II. And uh, they would often complain about spicy Burmese food and, and ask for raw fish instead. 
Uh, and then themes in play. Um, <clears throat> this is most often where the kids will compulsively play at the occupation of the previous person, even though there's no one in his family or no role models uh, for that occupation. So for instance, there's a little boy who played at being a biscuit shopkeeper for just hours on end uh, to the point that he refused to go to school. And he fell behind and, and his mom felt like he never really caught up. Um, and then occasionally in the play you'll also see, and, and I'll talk about this with a case in a minute, uh, you'll see where the child will reenact the death scene over and over, uh, which can be a little spooky to, to witness sometimes. Um, and then cross-gender behavior. In the cases where the, the child describes a life as a member of the opposite sex, many of them will often show uh, behaviors that, that are more appropriate for the opposite sex. In fact, the, the case I showed you with the little boy with the mark down his neck, who, who was his, uh, seemed to be his grandmother, uh, that case we published as an example of gender identity disorder because he uh, said repeatedly that he I wanted to be a girl. He would wear his mom's makeup and put on her dresses. And um, uh, in his play, he'd always play with the, the girls and not the boys. So um, that was sort of an extreme example. Um, sometimes these behaviors will go away as the kids get older and, and go on with their lives, but, but actually not always in that case. And, and Ian did have some follow-up with adults where they were still um, having uh, gender identity issues. Um, but most of the kids will go on to lead perfectly ordinary um, lives just like everybody else. So uh, these behaviors are evidence of a link to a past life, but they're also evidence that it's not just memories that can carry over, that, that uh, emotions and, and feelings seem able to, to carry over after somebody has died as well. Uh, now I want to tell you a little bit about some American cases. Um, once Ian started publishing his work, he would occasionally get letters from American parents um, talking about their kids who had, who had been very similar to the cases he'd published. They were often, though, they were, the parents would write by the time the, the kids had already grown up uh, because they didn't hear about Ian's work earlier. Uh, but then we set up our website in, in 1998, so 15 years ago. And since then, we have heard from uh, a lot of American families, um, scores of American families, uh, where their kids have, have been saying similar things. And most of the parents say that they had no prior belief in reincarnation before the kids start saying these things. And what we see is that with the American cases, the features are very similar to the ones in, in other places. Uh, so the kids start talking about the past life at a very early age. Uh, they also talk about the, the end of the life. Um, some of them have had birthmarks, not very many, but some have. Uh, a lot of them show the, uh, the strong emotions and, and behaviors that the people in the other places do. Uh, so these are proof that this is not purely a cultural phenomenon because these cases here are taking place in families with no belief in reincarnation and in our culture with no general belief in, in reincarnation. Uh, so clearly it's something more going on than, than something cultural. Uh, which raises the question for us is could there be psychological factors that lead these children to say these things? Uh, so we did a study, a, a small study of, of American cases uh, we did psychological testing on, on 15 of them, and uh, the particular numbers aren't in, important here, but this is the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale, uh, which is a common one used for, for young children. Uh, the kids that we were testing were ages three to six, so we were doing very young children. And with the intelligence test, uh, the average in the general population is 100. And what you see here is that uh, these kids are quite bright. And their average was 115. In fact, of the 15 kids that we tested, only one of them had an IQ under 100, and hers was 99. So as a group, they're quite bright. Uh, very good verbal reasoning, uh, as well as quantitative. Um, and these are all, with one exception, these are all sig statistically significantly above uh, 100. Uh, we also had the parents complete what's called a child dissociation checklist. Uh, it includes 
normal symptoms of dissociation like daydreaming, uh, but then more sort of pathological things like you might see in multiple personality disorder. And with a couple of exceptions, the kids scored very low, meaning they are not dissociating. Uh, that, that does not explain why they are saying these things. Uh, we also had the parents complete what's called the child behavior checklist, which is a common scale used in, in child mental health clinics. And they, the, uh, you get scores in various areas, and uh, the, the kids' scores were all in the average range for all of the areas. So uh, there were no uh, warning signs about any behavioral sorts of issues. So with the um, psychological testing, the, the end result is that the kids tend to be very intelligent, uh, but otherwise uh, be perfectly normal psychologically. Um, <clears throat> now to tell you about a couple of American cases. Uh, this first one is a little boy uh, named Sam Taylor, and he was born 18 months after his father's father died. And then one day when he was a year and a half old, his, his dad was changing his diaper, and Sam looked up at him and said, when I was your age, I used to change your diapers. His parents thought that was a little odd, and uh, they had never considered reincarnation, and in fact his mom was the daughter of a Southern Baptist minister. Um, but the boy kept talking about the past life of his grandfather. He would say, I used to be big, I used to be grandpa. And his mom in particular became intrigued by this, so she started asking him questions. When she asked him about siblings, he said he had a sister. Um, uh, she died. Bad men turned her into a fish. And it turned out that the grandfather had a sister who had been murdered some 60 years before, and her body had been dumped in the bay. And his parents felt certain that he had never heard about that. Uh, then also he talked about how um, his wife, at the end of his life, would make milkshakes for him every day. And not only that she made milkshakes, but that she would make them in the food processor rather than the blender, which in fact the, the uh, grandfather's wife did do for him. Uh, then when Sam was four and a half, his, his grandmother died, and his dad went out to collect her belongings. Um, he came back with family photos, and, and before that, uh, Sam's family did, had not had pictures of, of his father's family in the house. Um, but he brought back a, a group of photos, and um, his, Sam's mom had him spread out on the coffee table one night looking at him, and Sam came over and started looking at pictures of his grandfather pointing at him and saying, that's me, that's me. And uh, there was a picture of a car, no one in it, just a picture of a car, and uh, Sam said, hey, that's my car. And in fact, it was the first car that the grandfather had owned. Um, so to test him, um, Sam's mom showed him this class photo and said, all right, show us who you were. And Sam ran his fingers along the different faces in the stopped at the one of his grandfather and said, that's me. Um, <clears throat> This next case I want to talk about is from my book that's coming out next month called Return to Life, which, uh, as Mark mentioned, is, is a group of uh, American cases that I've recently studied. And this is one of the more interesting ones that I'm about to talk about. Uh, it's one that you may have heard about, actually. James Leininger uh, is a little boy. Uh, the case has been on TV. Some of the parents eventually wrote a book about it. Um, but he's a boy who talked about being a World War II pilot uh, who was killed during, uh, during the war over the Pacific. And it's now believed that the pilot that he was recalling has, has been identified. Um, so his parents were this Christian couple uh, living in Louisiana and uh, just sort of minding their own business. And his father, in fact, was quite opposed to the idea of past lives. Um, I met them when um, James was about to turn 12 and fortunately his dad had kept records of everything, but he was about to turn 12, and even then, his father would make a lot of biblical references as he was talking about all this. So it seemed that he was still trying to um, um, incorporate his family's experiences with his Christian religious beliefs. And the case started when um, James was 22 months old, 
and his father took him to a flight museum. And <clears throat> James kept wanting to return to the World War II exhibit and kept wanting to, to the point that they spent three hours in the museum. Now, for any of you all who are parents, uh, you know that for a child to want to spend three hours in a museum is kind of an extraordinary event uh, all by itself. And um, a couple of months later, James began having terrible nightmares in which he would kick his legs up in the air, screaming, airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. And he would have these repeatedly, night after night after night. And after I, I met with his family, I also talked with his aunt, who had spent a lot of time with the family. And she said, you could not believe how disturbing these things were to witness, that it really looked like someone fighting for his life. Um, and then during the day, he would take his toy airplanes and he would say, airplane crash on fire and bam, slam them into the coffee table. And this is a picture, he apparently has tolerant parents, but this is a picture of their coffee table. I don't know how well it shows up, but there are dozens of scratches and dents where he would just repeatedly say, airplane crash on fire and slam it into the table. Now that play is what we might call post-traumatic play if we saw a kid in the clinic, um, where kids who have experienced or witnessed traumatic things will often relive it in their play. So for instance, we had a girl in our clinic one time who unfortunately had, had witnessed a toddler fall down stairs and, and was killed. And the little girl in her play in the dollhouse, she would constantly have dolls falling down the stairs. So that's what we call post-traumatic play. Well, James is doing the same thing except he hadn't experienced anything traumatic, at least in this life. Uh, but when you combine that play with these repeated nightmares, um, it suggests a traumatized child. And, and he didn't have full-blown post-traumatic stress disorder, but certainly these features look like a child with, with PTSD. Um, and then there were also several conversations that his parents had with him um, <coughs> after his second birthday, so he's a young two-year-old, uh, he talked about how his plane had crashed on fire, how it had been shot down by the Japanese, and how he had flown a Corsair. Now, a Corsair, for those of you like me who don't know anything about planes, a Corsair was a special plane that was developed during World War II. It's sort of one of these hotshot new, new planes that was developed. And after James's parents, uh, were on TV talking about this case, critics said, well, he just saw a Corsair at the flight museum, and that's how the, the, the war stuck in his mind. And, and in fact, if you go to the flight museum's uh, website, you see that, in fact, they do have a Corsair. However, James's dad said it wasn't there when they went. And I looked into it and found that, in fact, dad was correct. The flight museum had had a Corsair, but it had crashed in, during a uh, air show a couple of years before uh, James and his dad went to the museum. They then got a subsequent only a replacement, but again, a couple of years after James and his dad were there. So there was not a Corsair. That is not where uh, James got the word when, when he was two years old. Um, he also said that he flew off a boat. And his parents asked him, what was the name of the boat? And he said, Natoma. Now, I think if most of us had to guess the name of an American aircraft carrier, it would be a long time before we'd come up with the word Natoma. And in fact, James's dad said, that sounds Japanese to me. And James said, uh, no, it was American. Um, and then <laughs> that night, his dad then went and did what any of us would do, do a uh, online search uh, for Natoma. And after doing a lot of searching, he eventually found this article <clears throat> about the USS Natoma Bay, which uh, in fact was a, an escort carrier that was stationed in the Pacific during World War II. Now if you look, I don't know how well that projects, but as you look at the very bottom here, this is the date that his dad printed this out, 827-2000, uh, which was when James was 28 months old. So we have documentation that by the time of 28 months, so two years and four months, uh, James had said the word Natoma. And in addition, they asked him who he was, and he would always say me or James, which at the time they didn't make anything of. 
One time they asked him, well, who else was there? And he said, Jack, Jack Larson. Uh, so keep that name in mind. Um, and then when James was two and a half, um, his dad bought a book on Iwo Jima to give to his dad, James's grandfather, for Christmas. And one Saturday morning, James's dad was, was looking through it, and, and James came and, and hopped in his lap. And they were just thumbing through it, and when they got to a page that showed a picture of Iwo Jima, James said, that's where my plane was shot down. And his dad said, what? And James said, my airplane got shot down there, Daddy. And James's dad was just floored by that. And, and I think from that point on, uh, James's dad, even though, frankly, they would have, he and his wife would have fights about all of this, he began to believe that maybe this was a past life memory. And he learned that, in fact, the Natoma Bay uh, did take part in the Iwo Jima operation. Um, and also, James started getting old enough to draw, and he would repeatedly draw these uh, pictures of airplanes, and he would always sign them James III. Now, you might think that was because he was three years old. Those parents say no. Uh, when they asked him about it, he said, I'm the third James. I'm James III. And, and in fact, he kept signing it that way even after he turned four. Uh, so he was saying that he was the third James. Uh, and then, with this picture and lots of others that he did, there are all these dots on it, which his dad said, and I tend to agree, it looks like incoming flack uh, that, that he is attempting to draw. Um, so they began to wonder about a past life, and they contacted Carol Bowman. She is a, a woman who's written a couple of books about past life memories, and in fact, lives fairly close to here. She's uh, in media. Um, and she then got contacted by, um, ABC. ABC was doing a show called Strange Mysteries, and uh, it was going to be a special where they um, did segments on various weird things, and one of them they wanted to do was on uh, past life memories. So they contacted Carol, who then um, contacted the Liningers about appearing on the show, and, and the Liningers were agreeable to doing that. Now at this point, they had no way of knowing if what James was saying was actually accurate for a pilot who had lived, um, but they knew that he was talking about it a lot. Um, this show never actually aired, but they had also interviewed me for it, so they sent me a copy of it. Um, so it now exists as documentation of, of what James had said and done um, before anyone knew if there's a pilot that actually matched his statements. So on this strange mystery segment, they talk about how he had nightmares of, of, plane, uh, of a plane crashing on fire and sinking and being unable to get out. He said that he flew a Corsair, that he flew off a boat, and that he was shot down by the Japanese. Uh, one afternoon, he said to his mom, Mama, before I was born, I was a pilot, and my airplane got shot in the engine, and it crashed in the water, and that's how I died. In the narration, uh, they say how James may have been a pilot who died in the Battle of Iwo Jima. And then also, when they were filming the segment, he was talking to the crew about Corsairs, and he said how they always got flat tires. Uh, so the, then ABC interviewed this uh, military historian who explained that with Corsairs, they had very hard landings, so they were always blowing out tires. Um, not something that most of us would know. Um, Five months after that interview, uh, James's dad went to his first Natoma Bay reunion. And one thing he learned was that there indeed had been a Jack Larson um, on the Natoma. James's dad had been searching for uh, a Jack Larson among the um, casualties, but in fact, Jack Larson is still alive. And um, his, James's dad went and, and met him and, and talked with him. And the other thing he learned was there's only one pilot from the Natoma Bay who had been killed during the Iwo Jima operation. And this was a 21-year-old named James Houston. And he was from Pennsylvania. In fact, he was from quite near here. He, well, he grew up in several places, but mainly grew up in Bryn Mawr. And um, since he was the only pilot from Natoma who was killed in Iwo Jima, that means 
um, we can look and see how well James's statements match with James Houston's life. Um, so I've got a list here that I'm going to show. The list is just ones where we have definite documentation that was made before James Houston was identified. Um, James Leininger also made other statements, including about uh, his early life. And his parents then talked with James Houston's sister, uh, who was quite elderly at that point. Uh, but she confirmed the details of, of the early life, which had to do with Houston's father being an alcoholic and um, tearing up the house at one point in various details. Um, but those things, no one wrote those down at the time. So we don't have documentation <clears throat> made at the time, so we haven't included it in the list. But these are the things where we do have definite documentation again, made before James Houston was identified. Uh, so in comparing it with Houston, uh, James Leininger signed his drawings James III. Houston was James Jr., which would make James Leininger the third James. Uh, James said he flew off the Natoma, and Houston was a pilot on the Natoma Bay. Uh, James said he flew a Corsair. Houston had flown a Corsair. He was actually flying a different plane when he was killed, but he had been part of the group of pilots who uh, had, had um, been test pilots for the Corsair. Um, James said he was shot down by the Japanese. Houston was shot down by the Japanese. Uh, he said he died at Iwo Jima. Houston was the only Natoma Bay pilot killed in the Iwo Jima operation. James said my airplane got shot in the engine and it crashed in the water and that's how I died. Uh, eyewitnesses reported that Houston's plane, quote, hit head on right on the middle of the engine. James had nightmares of plane crashing and sinking in the water. And uh, Houston's plane crashed in the water and quickly sank. In fact, by the time uh, other pilots got there to try to do a rescue, um, it was completely underwater and there's just sort of a stain on, on top of the water. And um, James said that Jack Larson was there, and Jack Larson was the pilot of the plane next to Houston's on the day that he was killed. All right. Um, <clears throat> I want to finish up by talking a little bit about potential patterns in these cases um, that we can discern from the database. And <clears throat> there are several factors that indicate that after an unusual death, the individual is more likely to go to strangers, whereas after a more ordinary death, they're more likely to return to the same family. So with this, um, again, this is assuming that these are cases of reincarnation, then looking at the patterns of, of, of what may happen. Uh, so one of these factors is um, looking at the type of death. With a natural death, you probably can't read these titles here, but the, the fourth column um, are the stranger cases, and then the fifth column is the same family. So what you see in the natural death cases, you, we've got more of the same family cases than, than the, uh, the stranger, whereas in the unnatural death cases, we've got a lot more of the stranger cases. Um, it also seems that uh, we've got statistically significant results that with the strangers, uh, the previous person was significantly younger uh, than in the same family cases. Um, this is in the natural death. Um, and also that in the strangers, the death is more likely to be unexpected, uh, even in the natural death cases. We code for how expected they are. And um, so like a sudden heart attack is very unexpected. So even in the unnatural death cases, it's the stranger ones that, that tend to be um, more unexpected than, than the same family. There's also a trend in the suicides. We, will, we don't have enough to do stats on that, but with the suicides, again, it seems to be more common in the stranger cases. Um, so um, the way that I put all this together is that with the same family cases, there's this emotional pull that pulls them back to have another life with the family. Um, in the stranger cases, you don't have that same kind of pull, so these, it's these other factors, these more unusual type of deaths that lead the individual to come back quickly, but not necessarily back into the same family. Uh, and then another factor to look at a little bit is um, 
personality. In our database, there are um, six factors that we code for uh, related to personality or behavior that we code for both, both for the child and for the previous person. And these are ones that were set up a long time ago, and, and they're uh, a little quaint maybe with terms like saintliness, but the, the, the ones are attachment to wealth, criminality, philanthropy or generosity, active and religious observances, uh, they're, whether they're meditators or not, and then saintliness. And uh, with many cases, we don't have this information for either for the child because he or she's too young, uh, or for the previous person because no one asked. Uh, but even so, so we got small numbers for each of these factors, but even so, there is a significant, statistically significant correlation between the amount of every feature in the previous person and in the child. Meaning that the more that the previous person showed it, uh, the more likely the child was to show it as well. Now, the correlation is certainly not one to one, and we know that genetics and environment have an impact on personality development. Uh, but it also looks like that whatever this is that carries over, that it can affect personality development as well. Uh, so it, it would suggest, again, that it's not just memories or, or thoughts that carry over, but there's, there's something more to it that carries over and, and that can affect personality and, and, and emotions as well. Um, so to conclude here, um, our cases are evidence that memories, emotions, even physical trauma uh, can carry over to another life, that, that when a person dies, it doesn't necessarily mean that their consciousness completely dies, uh, but in fact, something seems to carry over. But it's important to keep in mind that our cases may be special cases, and, and they are special in the sense that, that they're intact memories that come with them. Um, but that may be, um, they may be special in other ways too, and for instance, as I've mentioned, uh, they tend to be um, died violently, died young, uh, they tend to come back very quickly. So if this may be a case of just one end of the bell curve, if you're looking at number of deaths and then the interval between lives, ours tend to be at this very short end here. And um, they may not be typical of the process for the rest of us, and if in fact we, we do all reincarnate. Uh, it may look different, but in any case, uh, these cases definitely contribute to the body of evidence, which is from a variety of areas of research, but the body of evidence that uh, consciousness is separate from the body and that it can survive after death and continue on, perhaps in a variety of ways, but may be able to uh, carry on and then continue in another life. Uh, so I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions, which I have done. Uh, so I will take questions from the floor. Yes. Well, uh, when you started your lecture, um, I had a huge birthmark on the lower back of my rear, posterior, or whatever. And when my family, I come from a large family, and um, I'm number seven out of eight. And when I was little, I used to, people still joke with me and my family about it, because whenever my older sisters and brothers would tell me to do something, I would come back and say, well, when I was big, I could do that. Hmm. So you showed that slide afterwards. And um, so I'm just curious, is there some way that I should find out or go to someone and find out if I, I mean, I've always felt I've always been uh, different and weird or whatever. I do have <laughs> phobia of drowning. Hmm. And um, so even though I was taught to swim, it's not one of my favorite things to do. My excuse is that I don't like holding my breath. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I wonder, is there a way that I could find out if I'm, you know, because I, when you showed that slide, it freaked me out because yeah. I'm joked about that all the time yeah. that I go around saying. So, so the question is, um, she was born with a birthmark and also when she was little, <clears throat> she would say when I was big, I used to do such and such. And she's wondering if there's a way to find out if in fact she had a past life. First of all, on the birthmarks, uh, Ian made a point of saying, he wasn't saying he could explain all birthmarks this way, um, but that it 
could be one explanation. And, you know, the thing, when I was big, I mean, like you say, you had a lot of older siblings, so it's hard to know. I mean, that's the kind of thing that these kids do say, when I was big, I did such and such. But then they will go on to give details where it's clear they're describing another life. Yeah, and I, um, I like yeah. calling it or yeah. anything, but. So as far as how to access it, those memories now, if, if in fact you had one, um, there's no reliable way to do it. And, and I mentioned earlier that uh, these kids have not been hypnotized. Um, Ian and me also, but Ian is quite skeptical about hypnotic regression because hypnosis is it's a very unreliable tool, meaning there are times where it can be amazing for memories of this life. So for instance, people can recall a license plate from a crime scene. But then there are other times where the mind just fills in the blanks. And once someone has been through hypnosis, it's very hard to tell, for them to tell, was this imagination or was this an actual memory? Uh, so with hypnotic regression, uh, you know, there are reputable people like Brian Weiss, obviously, who do it. Um, but even then, I mean, Brian Weiss will say that he did it because it was therapeutic. He wasn't necessarily saying all these people were accessing past lives. Uh, now, also, some people will report past life memories during intense meditation. And so if you, you know, people have a strong meditation practice, some of those things may come up. Those, again, are usually unverified and unverifiable, I mean, if you recall an ancient life, but it's not to say there's not some value to it. Uh, so it's a very long way of answering your question with no, not really. Okay. Um, but it's, it's uh, interesting to think about anyway. Yeah. Yes? That was a pretty interesting talk. Thank you. Um, you don't have any timelines on your any is there any? Well, again, with ours, the, the median is 16 months, which so is very recent. But then James Leininger is 50 years. So there are certainly exceptions. And, and I will say, I mean, occasionally I have heard from American parents where they said um, their child seemed to be describing a life from ancient times. And then it's completely unverifiable. There's nothing really to be done about it. But so. Um, it would make sense that there would be ones on the other end of the bell curve too, so that there could be ones with a long interval between lives and, and then have those memories come up. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. I yes. have two questions. Sure. One, have you had a chance to include any tokus in your research, the Tibetan reincarnate? And secondly, have you had a chance to talk with Dr. Eben Alexander at the publication of this book, Proof of Heaven? Um, to answer the first, we have not had access to tulkus, so no, we have not studied any of those cases. Um, <clears throat> I mean, obviously, some of them, I'm sure, are very interesting, the things the kids remember. Um, as I recall, with the Dalai Lama, uh, of course, he was identified through tests and so forth, but he doesn't, at least as an adult, doesn't report any past-like memories. Uh, so maybe even with the tulkus, that those memories may fade away after a while. Um, as far as Evan Alexander goes, yes, he um, um, lives near Charlottesville, actually, he lives in Lynchburg, and, and he has come to our group some. And for those of you, if, if you've lived in a cave and you're not familiar with his book, uh, Proof of Heaven, uh, has been on the bestseller list for over a year now uh, about his own experience, uh, his own near death experience. And it's interesting, he comes at it from a, a Christian viewpoint and, and will talk about Christian beliefs associated with it, but also talks about reincarnation. Uh, so it, it seems that his experience led him to, to believe in past lives as, as well as to sort of firm up his own Christian beliefs. Yes. <clears throat> The idea of time and space when we talk about intervals between dying and coming back, as far as I understand it, time and space are, con are um, conventions of this physical experience. So on the other side of the veil, for lack of a better term, um, it, it may not be that experience. Um, 
if we're if we're saying these um, case studies happen within 18 months of a death, we may only be experiencing the ones that have um, those emotional needs to come back very quickly. So we easily project that the same timelines going on when somebody's not incarnate, but I don't think that that's the case. Yeah. Well, I would agree completely with that. I mean, I can't imagine that it's linear on the other side. I mean, it, it sort of probably goes beyond our ability to understand it. Um, <clears throat> and you're right. I mean, the, the, again, our cases may be very special cases where there is this um, either a need to come back or just this pull back um, because of things that weren't unfinished business, as they say, the, the, from the previous life. Sure. I kind of have a, oh, sorry, I have a twofold question. The first one, which is the parents of James, did they ever say why they named him James? Huh. I just find it interesting that it's James basically three. Um, he, you don't always see the same case of the same name, and we're talking more or less about the child, but I find it rather interesting that they would give him the name James and he has held that for quite some time. That's on the first front. And the second front, when these children are remembering this and, and as detailed as that, yeah, that's essentially an opening to a different frequency. It's, it's, it's quite a big deal. So in the study of that is one thing, but going forward, how does one work with them in the sense of utilizing that capacity so in their journey for this lifetime, we we'll all have to either correct our mistakes or continue forward. I would think it would be a huge asset for those that can remember like that so young to then utilize this lifetime in the right way. All right, well, the first question, um, as far as the name for James Leininger, it, um, I don't recall. If, if I, I'll have to look back on my notes. If I did ask, then there was nothing unusual about it, but I don't recall. Um, I've got a stack like this of notes, so I'd have to look back at it. Uh, the second part is a little more complicated about how do you keep the window open. Most of the time it just closes. I mean, the, the kids in grade school are indistinguishable from any other kid. And that may well be for the best. I mean, I've got a couple of cases now where uh, the window really has not stayed closed. And these kids, uh, one more so than the other, but both of them, um, seem to be quite psychic. And that can be sort of good and bad when you're a young child trying to make sense of how you go through life. And, and you know, there have been disturbing things that one boy in particular, um, and he's, he's in the, my next book also, but um, some of the things that he knows ahead of time, like his grandfather's his cancer, and uh, including recently where grandfather had throat cancer and and Ryan, the little boy, said his throat is going to be fine, but he's got it in his lungs. And then he goes for the next doctor's visit, and sure enough, there's scar tissue in his throat, but they found a new spot on his lungs. Um, but it's hard to feel like you're an ordinary kid just playing with others and being normal, having a quote-unquote normal childhood when you've got this huge piece open too. So, Hopefully, in the long run, as an adult, he will say, yes, I'm glad that I had this, even though it was difficult at times. Uh, and in fact, some of the adults do say similar things to that. But it, it does not make the journey easy by any means. Yes? Next question. Um, two, two, two memories come to my mind. First of all, I read many years ago, and I believe it was Mozart. Mozart's mother cleaned churches at night. And he, she would take him to the church, and the boy was less than five years old. And one time they unlocked the organ, it wasn't locked that night. He sat down and began to play music. So it was just unbelievable that this child could show up and do that. That was one story that I was surprised that comes back to mind this morning. The second one was a case of a friend that had a heart transplant. And in his normal life, he was fanatically uh, cautious of his diet. In all ways, he was such a perfect eater of natural. He 
and walked off from the heart transplant and insisted on having a McDonald's Big Mac. <laughs> Good for him. And you laugh, um, and, and, and you laugh at those stories yeah. and you think about it. There's a piece of consciousness in both of those that somehow got there. Yeah, so with the first one, the, the question of prodigies, I mean, certainly people have wondered if a prodigy comes in with, with uh, sort of gets a head start because of a past life. Um, in general, prodigies like Mozart, I'm not aware that any have ever said that they remembered a past life. Although, you do, I mean, even though Mozart's father was a music teacher, there are lots of music teachers who are kids and none of them produced Mozart. So you do have, it, prodigies is a, uh, unexplained um, phenomenon, to be sure. And in fact, in, I keep harping back to my exciting new book, Return to Life, which is available for pre-order now. Um, but there, there is one case where a little boy um, was obsessed with golf. And even at age three, the, the local golf school took him in for lessons, even though they normally started at age six, because this kid was essentially a golf prodigy. And he, did, he said, that he had been Bobby Jones, who was a famous golfer back in the 20s. So that, that may be the one exception of where Prodigy did talk about a past life. Uh, the other issue about the heart transplant, there have been writings and, and books about this phenomenon of transplants, most often heart transplants, where people did seem to have personality changes. So uh, there's a woman, and people may know the name that, that has slipped my mind, but Change of Heart, maybe that would be a good title for the book anyway, but a uh, woman who had a heart transplant and um, wakes up and starts being interested in, uh, being attracted to like biker chicks and having a change in diet with, with eating a lot of fatty foods and, and the donor had been a, uh, a man who had had those uh, likes and dislikes. Um, those are kind of hard to explain sort of in any way except that Again, things aren't necessarily linear. Consciousness, we think of it, mind being in the brain, but it, it may be uh, more involved in that, and it may be that the heart sometimes can, can carry some of the consciousness as well. Yes, in the back. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if any of your studies incorporated um, brain scanning to determine if any frequencies are common across <coughs> these cases. Because if the memories are represented in the in the universe as electro electrical impulses, would it be that these children are picking up those frequencies? And for that brief period of three to five years of age, they're tuned in. And then they grow out of it and are no longer tuned in. Well, it's a great question. And we have talked about it, but we have not done that kind of work, partly because with the aging cases, there would be such a sort of culture shock with getting brain scans done with them. Um, with the American ones, I mean, certainly EEG, you know, there's no risk associated with that. Um, but kids have to be still for an EEG to work, so you have to sedate them. So it's not, it wouldn't be super simple to do, but it's probably something that, that we should do at some point. Um, I think I'm about, Mark, I think we're about out of time and ready for lunch. Is that, uh, seems to be what the clock says. Um, I do want to say, as far as I noticed, that there's some of my copies of my first book out there. Um, I'm gonna have to leave after lunch because there's a little boy just outside of Philadelphia and who's talking about a past life, so I'm gonna go meet uh, him and his family. Uh, so if you do have, if you want me to sign uh, books, I'd be more than happy to do it. Just make sure to catch me during lunch uh, so that I can, can sign it for you. And then here's Mark to, uh, to wrap up. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. Um, would you see Dr. Pratap for a moment? Um, lunch follows, and we'll extend our next program with Jocelyn Kessler till around 2.15, back in this room. 
Um, the setup for lunch is in the, the, uh, the room behind us, and you'll present your lunch ticket as you, as you go through. And if anyone has any other questions. Enjoy, and we'll see you back here at 2.15.